Okay, the next speaker is, is in the design. And please, if you can introduce yourself. Okay. Uh, thank you, Daniele. And good afternoon. Uh, my name is Indarjeet Clare. I'm from a company called RMSI in India. Uh, I'm going to be building on uh, what Daniele and Mark have already talked about, which is using. Uh, Uh, using remote sensing data to develop an uh, exposure database. Uh, we've done a lot of projects for the World Bank in different parts of the world uh, on disaster risk assessment, hazard, and vulnerability mapping, and these are some of the learnings that we have from there. Uh, some of this stuff is familiar. I'm going to run through this fairly fast. That from an exposure database point of view, uh, we need the quantification of the building inventory, how many buildings are there, where they are located, what are the types of these buildings, uh, what are the uses that they're put to? What are the materials, the structures that they use? Uh, we also look at the, the features of the building, the quality of construction, what was the building codes that were followed, how well were they followed. And I want to make a distinction between the data that is available in the developed world versus the developing world. A lot more information is available about buildings and characteristics, both at government level as well as with the owners of the buildings. You can get uh, floor plans for buildings, occupancy, everything. But in the developing world, a lot of that data is scarce. I'm going to talk more about the developing world. Uh, how do we get information that we need in terms of number of occupants of the buildings, how many floors are there, uh, what is the usage for these buildings, uh, what kind of uh, costs would be associated with actually replacing these buildings or repairing them in the event of a natural hazard. We covered this. I want to skip through some of this stuff. We also need a lot of secondary data. Uh, are these buildings retrofitted? Uh, we did a project in Romania for the World Bank where they already have a retrofit program going on. So you have original building characteristics as well as which, which of them are retrofitted, and the behavior is going to be different as we go across them. The vulnerability state would change. The, the cost of replacing these buildings in the event of a natural disaster, so it's a function of the total built-up area and the cost per unit. Uh, these costs typically you can get from uh, interacting with the, the building and construction industry in that part of the world, or you could use standards which ap apply in that region. The, the data that we look at and what I'm going to talk about is actually two components. One is the basic land use, as Daniela and Mark have already talked about. Uh, and then how can you take that land use information and actually get exposure relevant information out of that? We do land use classification at four different levels. I'm going to use India as an example to talk through this. Uh, level one, which is what we do at country level assessments uh, using 30 meter, 50 meter kind of resolution imagery. Uh, do classification from that. Level two would be for the cities, which are more dense, so you have five meter resolution kind of data from there. Uh, level three is where you're actually getting down to clusters of buildings or groups of buildings uh, which have similar characteristics, which are within the dense areas of the cities. And level four, which has also been talked about, is actual individual 3D building footprints with height, with other information that, that can go with that. So here is a map of, uh, I think I skipped a slide now. This is good. So at level one, we're looking at, it's, it's actually Delhi. Uh, on the left is a level one map of Delhi, 30 meter resolution land use classification. On the right is a 3D map of a portion of Delhi, uh, individual buildings with heights and characteristics. So this is a map of India that we have created. I think we have data for about 60 countries at this resolution uh, that we have done. A lot of this work has been done for mobile phone companies or governments or everything where land use is one of the inf pieces of information that they need. This is a map for Delhi. Uh, as Daniela mentioned, how do you classify? What are the land use classes to take? Most of this is customer driven. We've had discussions with the client in terms of what is the land use that they are interested in, what are the classes that matter to them, and uh, how exactly are those classes defined. Uh, this can be tailor-made. There is no standard right now, but uh, depending on the requirements and for different parts of the world, you can actually come up with a standard land use classification using the same sensor. Uh, just a quick example on how this is done. So at 30 meter resolution, you can actually see that the built-up areas show up as cyan-colored pixels. Uh, they have different features and textures. I've highlighted some of those. 
uh, they can be classified as urban, semi-urban, or rural, based on the density and the size of these clusters that we have. So urban areas would be larger collection of this kind of pixels. A semi-urban would be this interspersed with some open spaces. Rural would be agricultural land surrounding some buildings. At level two, you get into more detail. So uh, one of the questions that was asked in a previous session this morning was, how do you get an exposure database for the whole world? Uh, if you actually do it at higher resolution, that is, is very time consuming and very expensive. So what would probably be a better option is to do low resolution and then for the urban areas do medium resolution and then overlay the hazard layers on top of that and the areas that are identified as being at risk, you could do a more detailed assessment for, for those pixels. Uh, from five meter uh, resolution, this is the kind of analysis you can do. So you can again get more details out of it. And then from an exposure calculation point of view, from the land use, uh, this is one of the methods that we use. This is for residential buildings. All the boxes in green is actual data that is available. Uh, all the boxes in blue are values that uh, are proxies taken from uh, secondary sources or from discussions of the rate of construction, for example. And all the red boxes is actually calculation. So you can end up with a total economic exposure value at administrative unit level. Typically, when we do these kind of assessments, we are looking at the smallest possible administrative unit that we could do it at, uh, district or county aggregated up to the state, aggregate up to the national level from there. Uh, the calculations for commercial and industrial buildings would be similar, but would have some additional parameters in terms of nature of business, number of employees, things like that. So this is, again, uh, for the breakup of Delhi uh, with more land use classes. The higher the resolution, the more you can differentiate. Uh, the point that Daniele made, the borders become less blurred as you go into higher resolution imagery. So that's what you can capture from there. I'll skip through that. A lot of this data, especially in the developing world, will need secondary uh, information. This is typically either available in the census. Uh, in Romania, for example, there was actually a building census by commune, which listed all types of buildings in each commune, so it was easy to do that. Otherwise, this would need to be classified from, uh, from other sources. As we get into a higher resolution imagery, you can also see the heights of the buildings, so you can start classifying them uh, based on the number of floors. And then at the highest level, which is uh, in dense urban areas, which are at high risk, this is, this is what we would recommend. Uh, you can see individual buildings. You can get the building heights and footprints. What we could also do is, uh, Mark had already mentioned, you could use oblique imagery. And just using a single oblique imagery, you could still get something like 80 to 85 percent coverage of the buildings that are there. Uh, with, with stereo, you could go up to 95 percent. Also, if you are actually doing this and you have the stereo imagery, you can use the same stereo processes to get a higher resolution DEM. Again, in most parts of the developing world, a DEM better than 20 or 30 meter resolution is not available. But if you are using stereo satellite imagery, you could actually get to a higher resolution DEM as well. So I'm going to finish on this slide, which is basically all the information that is captured from a mix of remote sensing as well as field and secondary data. Uh, and if you have that, go out into the field, collect some photographs and calibrate the actual data, then you can rerun the, uh, the tools on the imagery itself and come up with a detailed exposure database for the area, starting from country level, going down to individual building level, uh, and integrating that into a single exposure database. Thank you. We have one more speaker now, and it's uh, Guy Delamoy, uh, information extraction uh, from remote sensing. Um, yeah, that's fine. Uh, the third one. Uh, I don't see it here, but okay, fine. Um, so I'm trying to uh, add to these uh, three presentations more on the, with a focus on, on, on the, the processing that is needed, so uh, uh, not too much in detail, but uh, just giving you some elements of, of uh, what is possible in this, uh, in this automated uh, area. Uh, so I'm, I'm talking uh, 
uh, about processing of this very high uh, uh, resolution imagery, VHR, you see this term quite often, uh, which usually means that you talk about uh, imagery that has a resolution of uh, one meter or better. <clears throat> Uh, we talk about automated processing. In the next slide, I'll, I'll explain what, what, what the difference is. So basically machine-driven machine, machine uh, driven, uh, uh, processing mostly. And uh, we'll focus on uh, building presence, uh, build-up area, uh, some characterization of build-up, and also uh, some of the 3D aspects. And I uh, have a few slides also on uh, the use of SAR. Uh, again, for very high resolution SAR. So, um, what, what kind of processes we talk about? Uh, I think you've seen some, some examples uh, before. You have uh, basically the, the more manual work, uh, things we also, for instance, did in this damage assessment in, in Haiti, where you have a lot of interpreters that look in the, uh, the, the compare the pre and the, and the post imagery and then uh, mark uh, uh, what they see in, 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 uh, in the scenes. So very manual, uh, labor-intensive work. Uh, can also use, of course, uh, more uh, sophisticated imagery like, like pictometry. Um, then there is uh, what, what uh, Daniele showed before, this, this uh, segmentation followed by grouping, so semi-automatic where you, do, uh, you let the machine do a, a lot of grouping, but you still have to have at least some, uh, some control, some additional work to, to group this information. And uh, what we're talking about uh, in this particular presentation is, uh, is really about uh, letting the machine do uh, most of the work and, uh, uh, of course, standardized workflow that you can then implement on, uh, on, on machines. Uh, you've seen some of these examples before. So uh, in our group, we are uh, uh, working on, on, on two lines of, of, uh, of methods. One is uh, based on morphology, so uh, looking at uh, uh, shape uh, information. Uh, it actually uh, deploys not just the, the, the radiometry, so the the, the uh, spectral information in the imagery, but also the, say, the, the spatial correlation, the, the, the changes in, in, uh, in um, uh, the local uh, area of the image to uh, determine uh, shape and, and size, and uh, the kind of information you get from that is, uh, is uh, individual buildings, groupings of buildings, but also shape and, uh, and size parameters, and um, in a mostly automated uh, fashion. And, uh, what's interesting is here is, of course, that you can apply that to uh, uh, full city scenes. And uh, the other line of uh, work is, is, is more texture-based. This is uh, um, ignoring or at least uh, not using a lot of the radiometry, but uh, purely looking at uh, uh, what we call uh, higher order statistics to look at uh, uh, variation in the scene and derive that. This is giving you this coarser product, which is uh, like the, the build-up mask, yes, no. Uh, urban area, which you can uh, more easily apply across uh, large image sets. So, uh, uh, of course, the, the detail of the method has a certain cost uh, in, in terms of processing and uh, gives you a different kind of image. This is also something that, uh, that uh, Daniele showed. You can do this uh, easily uh, for um, complete uh, urban scenes, uh, scenes that are, uh, in the end, uh, relatively large, but uh, you can apply this method uh, relatively uh, uh, constantly over uh, different cities across the, across the world. Um, there are then this uh, computational challenges, of course. I mean, this is, after all, very large, uh, uh, relatively large volume. You talk about, if you look, uh, for instance, at uh, the current uh, state-of-the-art uh, high-resolution imagery of about uh, 0 0.6 or 0 0.5 meters, then a typical city scene is, is easily uh, 4 gigabytes or larger. And, uh, for instance, if you look at uh, the airborne uh, data sets that were made available for Port-au-Prince after the, the Haiti earthquake, then you already talk about easily about more than uh, hundreds of gigabytes of data, so it's a very large volume of information. Apart from, the say, the data assess, you have uh, the problem, of course, to process this quickly if you want to integrate that in, a, in an operational uh, exercise like a damage assessment or an or a, a emergency uh, support or emergency response. Um, ways to tackle this, I mean, you, you have actually, uh, you need the processing power to, to, to handle this kind of volumes, and uh, there are different ways, of course, you can, uh, you can work on the complexity of the algorithms that you use, uh, uh, things like optimization, linearization, and uh, what is increasingly uh, being available as well is uh, the use of clustered uh, uh, machines, so you basically cluster the, the, 
the, say, increasingly powerful CPUs that you may have in a, in a, in a team and let them work on this data. Um, say, developments in parallelization are also becoming more common. Another in, uh, interesting development is uh, currently the use of uh, graphical processing units. So we actually use uh, um, the graphical cards, advanced graphical cards that are relatively cheap uh, but are very performant. So they, uh, you can have uh, performance uh, um, in, in the order of uh, what I've been stating here in, in, in the end. So, so around uh, up to uh, one gigabytes per minute quite easily, which are then again uh, within a realis realistic uh, uh, order if you want to process these, these large volumes. Um, uh, both, in fact, in, uh, in say, what we usually call the reference mode, so where you do things uh, that are not urgent, but also in cases, for instance, in, uh, in the case of Haiti, where we were doing uh, um, damage detection uh, semi-automatically using these kind of approaches. So it is uh, realistic that you can uh, um, handle these kind of volumes um, in the time frames that you need. This is another example. We work with uh, the, the World Bank on, uh, on Guatemala. We have uh, an almost complete uh, autophoto coverage of that country, um, uh, which is about two terabytes of data at a half meter resolution. And the purpose here is also to produce an urban an urban characterization of the, of the country and uh, integrate that in, in, in uh, a, risk, uh, a risk assessment. And uh, we use basically the same uh, setup, the same um, computer power to address this, of course, in uh, slightly longer time periods, but uh, achievable uh, at that resolution. This is an example of uh, multi-tile uh, um, um, part of that, of that mosaic and, uh, and uh, just a blow up of an example where you can also, again, uh, derive the, the relevant uh, uh, settlement information for, uh, for the structuring of the, of the exercise. Uh, that you can integrate back into your imagery as enhanced, uh, uh, say, uh, images themselves of, of course, make available as uh, digital features that you make uh, that, that you can then integrate in any kind of GIS environment for further uh, uh, modeling or processing. Um, other areas are uh, of, our, of our work focus more on, on uh, this uh, the characterization of urban patterns. So where we again use uh, structure, shape, size, but also occurrence of, uh, um, for instance, vegetation uh, to typify uh, um, urban areas. Uh, this is just showing an example of how you use. Uh, uh, what we call vegetation indexes, so where you look at uh, occurrence of vegetation as an indicator of uh, uh, density in, in urban areas, and um, uh, use that information then again to characterize uh, uh, the, 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 the city, the city uh, areas. Uh, that again uh, has led to this idea that we are trying to uh, uh, make this uh, uh, you know, you can derive a, a lot of this information, uh, extract a lot of this information that you can then make available uh, as training sets so people can uh, use this information to look at what they, what they would consider uh, um, typical uh, urban patterns and then match them against uh, uh, data that they, uh, they have available themselves. So it can actually be uh, developed into something that is, uh, could be uh, used as, as a classification tool. And, um, and then based on the, on the uh, areas of interest, you could, you could tune this, this uh, tool to uh, give you the, the information that you are looking for. Uh, just a quick word on stereo images. So uh, we already saw some of that. So again, uh, stereo processing is uh, you have the same image more or less, but from a slightly different angle. Uh, whether, uh, well, this is mostly focusing on, on satellite uh, stereo, but you, of course, also have airborne stereo. So um, the, the matching of that is, is largely uh, automatic as well, software exists to do this. And of course the purpose of this uh, uh, exercise is to uh, look at the third dimension, so to try to get the height information out of the, out of the imagery and then uh, as much as possible uh, automatically integrate it in the information. This is a typical example of what you get out of a satellite uh, stereo, so you get a, a, a digital service model that uh, if in case you have uh, the footprints available of, 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 the, of the buildings allow you to uh, extract also the, the, the building height. Um, and that allows you then to uh, make nice visualizations, but this one is also uh, 
uh, integrated in a, in a, in a risk uh, modeling uh, um, uh, study. This is Alessandria in, uh, in, in Egypt, uh, an area very um, exposed to a number of risks, tsunami risk, but also uh, um, flooding from the, from the, 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 uh, the river areas and also uh, a number of uh, general hydrology problems and subsidence. Um, same, same, uh, me uh, similar measure before that, uh, the more, basically, the, this, this slide is showing that the more detail you need, uh, the more precise your information has to be, uh, the larger your effort becomes, the less automatic it becomes, uh, if you go towards the, the right side of this, uh, uh of this, uh, slide. So, uh, it depends. It's, it's, it's a decision you have to make. The data is more or less, uh, uh, to say that the technical capacity to, to collect this information is, is, is available and you have to, of course, decide on your typical case how far you want to go in this, uh, uh, in this schema in terms of uh, money, effort, and, uh, and uh, detail. And um, similarly, uh, what uh, Mark was also showing, this, this idea of uh, uh, this increasingly available idea of, of, of having uh, uh, your city models available um, is also a question of uh, how far do you want to go in the realism of that and uh, um, how much effort you want to you actually put into this. I mean, of course, this is becoming increasingly um, uh, automated, but I think the, 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 the current availability of this information is not as widespread as, as we would like to, especially if you consider, of course, uh, uh, maybe the non-Western uh, uh, economies where this data is not yet so widely available, but of course uh, has, a, has a, a great potential. <clears throat> Just a, a, a final word on, on SAR processing. Uh, in, in very high resolution SAR, you also have a possibility to look at uh, these texture-based uh, urban, urban, urban maps. Um, again, requiring uh, a fairly high resolution which is only available since a number of years in the public domain. It's just since two years, I think, that you can get uh, TerraSAR-like and Cosmos SkyMet, so two European SAR systems, in fact, that give you uh, SAR data at, the, at up to the, uh, the one meter resolution. So between, you have actually a series of options there. And uh, the interesting part, of course, in, in the one meter range resolution, you can start doing interesting things also uh, with the use of SAR. This is just to give you an impression of uh, how it compares to uh, a similar resolution optical. So on, on, on the left side, you have, a, uh, in fact, an airborne image of, of, a, of an, uh, an urban area in Germany. And the, the equivalent is on the, uh, say, the SAR image of the same area is on the, on, on, on the right. And, well, the main message here is that the, 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 there's a fundamental problem in the, or there's a fundamental aspect to SAR image formation that is very different from optical. So it's not so easy to transfer your knowledge that you may have in the optical domain straight into the SAR domain. But there are, there are ways to, to look at this uh, problem. And, and one way we have actually been exploring in our team as well is to use uh, um, SAR simulation. So you start with some, uh, for instance, uh, uh, building outlines in the, from the from the, SAR, uh, from the optical image, then use simulation uh, for the height, and then see if you can match the, the, the signature that you see in your SAR scene, and uh, uh, of course derive from that uh, the, the actual height. Now this is uh, a semi-automatic method. It, it, uh, um, it is uh, quite a, of course, a lot of work to, to, uh, to, to do this, but it is a possibility that has been uh, uh, we also been implying, uh, uh, applying in, uh, in, in, the, in, the other, in the other direction, so where we had uh, imagery um, uh, over the, uh, the recent uh, China earthquake, not the most recent one, but the one from uh, uh, the Sichuan, so the 2008 earthquake, and we used this methodology to basically detect um, collapsed buildings, so buildings that were no longer uh, giving the signature that you would have expected on the basis of its uh, estimated height. So again, it's, it's uh, quite a sophisticated method, but it is not as easy as you would expect uh, uh, to work with, uh, for instance, optical data. So uh, conclusions, uh, um, this, these processes uh, are uh, um, giving you 
this build up information at, at scales that are in this order of uh, magnitude, so 1 to 25,000 is, is uh, probably a very uh, useful, uh, I mean, widespread uh, um, uh, quality that, that you would want to use in exposure information. Um, it allows you to, to uh, generate also settlement maps at the city and country uh, level. Um, the method applies to either satellite or, or airborne data, either citywide or, uh, or uh, countrywide. Um, our aim is to, to get more consistent information at, at, at global level, especially, of course, for uh, the large urban uh, settlements, the large uh, metropoles and, and uh, the important areas, have, of course, uh, say, prioritized by uh, risk exposure. And uh, then, of course, in, in those cases, as I suggested before, of course, if you uh, need higher uh, value information, you can start using the more precise information, including stereo including uh, ancillary data that allows you to uh, generate uh, higher quality information. And uh, in some cases where you have difficulty obtaining this kind of information, you may consider a very high resolution SAR, uh, taken into consideration that it does require uh, additional expertise. Uh, that is the uh, end of my meeting, uh, my presentation. Thank you, Gordon.